once you combine quantum mechanics with classical physics, you get anomalies, divergences, things blow up in your face. The only way we know to control these divergences is through supersymmetry, which is the symmetry of strings. In other words, string theory has no rival. I repeat, string theory has no rival. Welcome, Professor Michio Kaku. So tell us about your latest book, which is about quantum computing and what the quantum advantage is. Well, you know, people have often wondered, what is the ultimate computer? Computer power keeps doubling every 18 months. That's Moore's law. When is it going to end? I mean, what is the most powerful computer possible? Well, computers have gone through three basic stages of evolution. Stage one lasted for thousands of years when we use levers, gears, ropes, string, whatever we can get to do calculations, like on an abacus. That's stage one. Then around World War II, we started to use electricity to convey these codes and then transistors to modify these codes. And we are in that era today. The wealth of nations is dependent upon computer power. That's how important computer power is today. We're in stage two, but now we are entering stage three, the ultimate computer, a computer that computes not on sticks, not on electricity, a computer that computes on atoms. So this is the ultimate computer. And of course, there's a race. There's a race to see who can market and dominate the world economy with these quantum computers. On one hand, we have the Chinese. They're using computation on light beams, using light beams to convey computation at the atomic level. And then the United States, we have Google, Microsoft, we have IBM using electrons and using the lessons from digital computers and generalizing it to quantum computers. So who wins that race could eventually dominate the world economy? Professor, I'm sure you get emailed theories of everything frequently and I don't know if you've noticed, but for myself, I've noticed an influx of them because no longer is it coming from someone's own research or their own ideas. It's coming from a prompt to chat GPT. And often it's incoherent or that it recapitulates a theory that exists. Like here's SO10, but this is new. What I'm wondering is, do you see some large language model that's based in quantum computing as somehow being different? and that could actually do fruitful research toward the God equation? Well, the chatbots that we have today are glorified tape recorders. No matter how many times people say, oh my God, these are human-like, they talk like a human being. Look, these are chatbots that simply roam the internet, grab different articles, splice them together, and then pass it off as if they wrote it. So it's like a sophisticated tape recorder. They're not original. They can't create anything new, spontaneously new. They don't know the difference between right and wrong, between truth and falsehood. It's just scrambling different aspects of the internet together. So what do we need? We need a fact checker to make sure that these chatbots don't go off the rails by quoting from teenage boys that create mischief on the, on the internet because these chatbots do not know the difference between a, something written by a teenage boy going off the deep rails and a learned scientist. They don't know the difference between these things. They are nothing but editors, editing together what already exists on the internet. They don't know the difference between right or wrong, true or false, and there has to be some regulations on these things. For example, in the United States, we have freedom of speech, but you cannot yell fire in the middle of a crowded theater. That is illegal. You get arrested for that. People could die. And therefore, there has to be some controls on chatbots. Otherwise, they could run amok. And all of a sudden, the, the teachings of teenage boys uh, become propagated around the world. And so there has to be an editor of some sort. And that's where quantum computers can come in. 
You see, right now, our computers are barely powerful enough to fact check some articles. But in the future, everybody's going to be on a chatbot of some sort. It's going to, it's going to be commonplace that we'll, we'll do our wedding invitations, our love letters. Everything will be done on a chatbot. And at that point, we need a fact checker. And that's not what is possible with today's digital computers. In the future, quantum computers not only will solve, hopefully, world hunger and give us unlimited energy, but will also solve the problem of fact-checking love letters and fact-checking what you write on the internet with a chatbot. What's the difference between a quantum computer doing fact-checking and a classical one? Uh, there's a huge difference. First of all, a chatbot, what is it? It's software. It's not hardware at all. It's software. It's limited by the amount of computing power that the computer has. It's a software program. It's coding. Now, what is a quantum computer? A quantum computer is hardware. The nitty gritty uh, power behind the calculations is done with hardware, not software. Software allows you to massage the data. But where did the data come from? Who is able to really you know, manipulate the data, scan through tons of data? That's where hardware comes into the picture, and that's where quantum computers can come in. So quantum computers not only can solve, for example, the energy crisis, we hope, food crisis, the weather, um, creating new particle accelerators, not only that, but we also hope they could be fact checkers so that teenage boys don't go off the rail. So it's not just that it has more computational power behind it. There's something else because it's more in touch with reality. That's right. But of course, it has more com more muscle, more computational muscle than a chatbot because a chatbot is coding. That's all it is. If you look at a chatbot, it's a series of zeros and ones, zeros and ones, zeros and ones. It's limited by the amount of memory you have backing it up. And that's where quantum computers come in because we're calculating now, not just on transistors, we're calculating on atoms. Now think about that for a moment. This is the ultimate computer. A transistor, for example, could be maybe 50 atoms across. That's sort of the limit that we're hitting, about 50 atoms across for an atomic transistor. But, by the time you are five atoms across, leakage takes place. The Heisenberg uncertainty principle kicks in. Heat is generated. The chip melts as a consequence. And so we're approaching the limit now. So if you look at computer power versus time, you see that computer power is flattening out. It's not going like this anymore. It's going like this and will flatten out in the future. Every Christmas, why would you buy an upgrade knowing that the computer is just as powerful as it was in last year's Christmas. This could affect the world economy. And so that's why Silicon Valley is definitely looking into quantum computers because they're no fools. They know mm -hmm. that they are masters of stage two, but stage three is around the corner. Often when I talk to researchers in quantum computing, they'll tell me there's so much that's overhyped about quantum computing. So can you... Can you tell us, well, where does the popular press get it incorrect? Yes. <laughs> First of all, there is a downside to quantum computers. In principle, they are so powerful, they can break any digital code. This means that the CIA is very much worried about this. Documents leaked from the CIA show that, yes, the CIA is worried that once quantum computers become commonplace, then people will be able to steal the crown jewels of any nation. The nuclear codes, the banking codes, all the secret data will be wide open for anyone who wants to tamper with the security of the CIA or a major bank. So that's one problem. Another problem is air correction. You see, we're dealing with atoms now, and atoms vibrate. Noise can affect the calculation and noise could make these atoms go haywire, and the calculation becomes useless. That's why a quantum computer, what do they look like? They look like a chandelier. What is the chandelier? The chandelier is pipes, pipes that control liquid helium. And it's the pipes that cool 
the quantum computer down to near absolute zero. And that's what you need to do a calculation. Now, stop for a moment. Mother Nature does quantum calculations at room temperature. What do we call that? We call those flowers, leaves, forests. <laughs> These are all quantum mechanical. The way in which a flower can capture a photon of light, combine it with carbon dioxide to make sugar, that's a quantum process. And we cannot duplicate that without bringing everything down to near absolute zero. So we got a ways to go to catch up. In other words, the ultimate quantum computer is Mother Nature. Mother Nature is still ahead of us. Mother Nature is a master of quantum computation. Cancer, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's diseases, all the biological processes of the body, DNA, all of that takes place at the quantum level. And we are blind. We are blind to that realm, the quantum realm. Digital computers compute on zeros and ones, zeros and ones, zeros and ones. How can that describe a molecule? A molecule like, for example, that causes cancer. You can't. You can't model cancer, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, any of these diseases using a digital computer based on zeros and ones, zeros and ones, zeros and ones. Mm -hmm. That's why we need a quantum computer to break through that. Do you think physical laws are mere descriptions of nature? Or do you think that they're somehow intrinsic, somehow more than that? So in other well, words, if someone was to describe you more and more accurately, does at some point that description become you? Well, some people believe that the laws of nature is nature. That nature is nothing but the collection of laws that allow the universe to evolve, to allow life to be formed. So the laws of nature and nature itself are identical. And some people even take it one step farther and say that the universe is a quantum computer. The universe itself, they say, is a quantum computer, which then, of course, leaves the next question open, which is, who programmed it? Mm -hmm. If the universe is a quantum computer, then who programmed it and kicked it and started the whole process of creating a universe? At that point, it becomes very philosophical. So a bias that you and I probably both share is that mathematics is the way to probe nature with infinite resolution. But it may be the case that like 50,000 years ago, you, well, even till recently, you had to invent a new type of microscope if you wanted ever more refinement. So electron microscopes, for instance, it may be the case that the tool of mathematics is limited and to accurately describe nature, we need something else that we can't even conceive of like, like, like 50,000 years ago, like with Pythagorean theorem, they didn't have any idea about let alone to speak about category theory or something that's, that's higher level. So do you think that's the case, that something else other than, than first order logic or mathematics is what's needed to be invented in order for us to come up with the God equation? Well, put it this way. Um, some people think that the laws of motion, which go back to Isaac Newton, and then, of course, refined by... Einstein, and then the quantum theory, right? That's embedded within the laws that make the universe work. And we can know these laws. And maybe at a certain point, the laws end. So this is called the onion theory. The onion theory is that the laws of nature are like an onion, layer after layer after layer. The first layer is cosmology. The layer below that is planetary physics. The air layer beyond that is Earth-like physics, going to life, going to people, and so on and so forth. And then as you keep on going, you get new laws coming in. However, I don't believe in that. I think that at a certain point, it probably does end. And it probably ends at the, quote, God equation, that we don't necessarily need any more laws of physics. You see, the laws of Newton are incomplete. You cannot create a Newtonian universe. The laws of Newton are incomplete because, for example, Newton cannot explain light. Newton cannot explain biology. Along comes Einstein, who says, no, we can explain light. We can explain the expanding universe. 
But quantum mechanics by itself, okay, just barely touches the surface of life. And then the next question is, do we need a new set of computational tools to unravel the secret of life and then beyond that? And I think that at a certain point, it stops. Now, where does it stop? It probably starts stops at the Planck energy. The Planck energy is 10 to the 19 billion electron volts. That's one with 19 zeros after it, or 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. That's one with 33 zeros after it. This is a very, very big number. It is the number that describes the Big Bang. It is the number which describes a black hole. That is the number where Einstein's theory fails. You were interviewed on a podcast, which the name of this podcast escapes me, but someone showed you a video of Eric Weinstein, who is criticizing not string theory, but string culture. And you said, hey, we welcome criticism. It's great. It's just that you should put something forward constructively rather than just criticize. And I believe the quote was put up or shut up. And I want to know, are you aware that Eric Weinstein has his own theory? So he has put up. Well, so far, all the theories that have been put up that are rivals of string theory have failed. Uh, they failed for basically three reasons. First of all, the theory has to incorporate all of Einstein's theory, which they can, which they can do. Second of all, they have to accommodate the standard model. And that's where a lot of these theories fail. That means 36 quarks and antiquarks, three generations of identical subatomic particles, 20 free parameters, that's the standard model. Only string theory has the richness to describe the standard model. And third, which is the real killer, is that once you combine quantum mechanics with classical physics, you get anomalies, divergences, things blow up in your face. The only way we know to control these divergences is through supersymmetry, which is the symmetry of strings. In other words, string theory has no rival. I repeat, string theory has no rival. Other competing versions do not have the standard model or they diverge. Take a look, for example, at loop quantum gravity, which is a very interesting theory. I've looked at it. Loop quantum gravity has a problem. It has no electrons, which means it has no matter, which means it's a theory of pure space, which means it's kind of useless. It's a theory of pure space with no electrons, no standard model, so, none of that. Just, and that's why string yeah. theory is different. String theory can accommodate the standard model. Carlo Ravelli said that that you can't have fermions in loop quantum gravity has only been true up until a few years ago. And that if anyone has kept up with the research with in recent years, they'd see that they were able to produce it. And then also when it comes to string theory, solving all of these problems, but other theories having issues... It's it's tricky to state that because there's also tens of thousands of people and plenty that go into string theory, whereas some other issues are just there in their bud. String theory in its bud also had issues that plagued it, and they were solved because plenty of attention and minds went into it. So you have to somehow normalize or reweight these theories by how much mental energy went into them. And if you do so, it's not clear to me, is string theory the winner? I don't know. My attitude is, let a thousand flowers bloom. Let all of them bloom, mature, so that we can pit them against each other, okay? We're not going to hurt anyone's feelings. These theories have no feelings. So let them clash, and let's find out the limitations of these things. Loop quantum gravity has a problem with fermions. The fermion loops are divergent. They blow up in your face. The only way known to cancel these divergences is through supersymmetry, which is the symmetry of strings. So in other words, we're still back to ground zero. The loop point of gravity does not have a theory with fermions that have finite results. And so what I'm saying is something very simple. You can read alternative versions that claim to have the theory of everything. Fine. But the acid test is to look for whether or not they can incorporate the standard model and whether or not they can control the divergences and anomalies. And so far, string theory is the only one which can do this. Now, that doesn't mean string theory is right. It just means it's the only game in town. Thank you so much, everyone. <laughs>